Brian, what are you doing these days? Well, as always, I'm a bit of a butterfly when it comes to mm -hmm. what I'm doing. I'm doing a little of this and a little of that. One thing I'm trying to do is try to figure out how to lead two kinds of revision session. One is for graduate students who have no mother tongue in common. There are 20 students and there's no common mother tongue. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. Revision, revising of translations, it's right? Revising of translations. Okay. And, uh, and you're doing training sessions for them, is this? No, th no, this is just a course. A course, okay, okay good. A master's level course All right, thanks. on revision. Yeah. Uh, so the question is how to work in a bit of practice. It's inevitably mostly about principles mm -hmm. revision, but how can I work in some practice when no one, when there's no common mother tongue? Okay. And so that's one thing I'm interested in. Right. Uh, the other one is what is uh, conducting webinars about revision with people from all around the world. So there I'm, one problem is squeezing the information into yep. 60 minutes. Okay. And uh, the other is, again, the same problem, that there are people from China, Brazil, Australia. Uh, so I have to think about what to say that will illustrate my points without mm -hmm. referring to any particular linguistic examples. Well, sometimes I refer to English. Sure, they, they tend to have that in common because yes. you're teaching. But I can't really talk about comparative revision. I just have to refer to it. But that's not so bad with the professional translators who attend webinars okay. because they all know, know about that. I can just refer to comparison of text. Then yeah. I said I was a bit of a butterfly. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm also interested these days in the question of so-called intersemiotic translation. Okay. I was attending a panel on that this morning. And I think uh, they, most of the people who are into that are, are looking at the wrong medium. That is, they, they talk about the relationship between language and pictures mostly, mm -hmm. turning a novel into film and so on. Yeah. Whereas I think the place to look is music. Mm -hmm. I've been having correspondence with a professor of musical composition at uh, Columbia University who uh, is a specialist in the relationship <laughs> between language and music. And I've discovered there's a huge literature on this in, mm -hmm. by musicologists. So I have this theory now that uh, when composers set uh, words to music, that is genuine translation, <clears throat> but of... Uh, prosodic features right. has nothing to do with meaning. Yeah. It's just uh, the question, I, I put it to this man, how, uh, what about the intonation pattern of the speech, if you're, if you're speaking the text aloud, the pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables, the meter of its poetry, how does that, what does the composer do with that? Mm. And he said, well, yes, the composer definitely looks at all those issues, and or as most composers do. Wagner. And, yes. Remarkably and, <clears throat> <laughs> and uh, uh, <clears throat> he thought that he said he, he would call that translation. Okay. So I'm looking into that question. <laughs> okay. That's strange because at the, as we speak, you're the author of an article in the journal Translation Studies, which sounds very conservative to some people. You're talking about translation studies looking at people who seek maximum invariance. Is that right? Yes. And that sounds the opposite from this connection with music. Oh, is but, it, but, is it? But, I, but that's what I'm, why I'm corresponding to this professor of music. I want to know whether there's a high degree of invariance. The reason I want translation right, studies okay. to stick with invariance is because I want it to stay closely tied to the profession of translation. Ah, right. Yeah, I can see Where, that. Yes. I mean, as we sit here, most people, Thousands of people around the world are translating, and mm. most of them, not all, but most, are trying to write something which means more or less what their source text means. Mm -hmm. So a high, not complete invariance, but a high degree of invariance. And I want to stick with that as a definition yeah. of translation. So I'm hoping to find it in music, musical composition. Okay. But this is like, I mean, it's seen as a conservative voice in contemporary translation studies where mm. people want to look at translation everywhere and that translation is different, creativity. When you bring in the music connection, though, you're sort of outflanking the opposition. That's my aim. Yes, I don't want to be seen as denying 
in what you might call non-linguistic translation. Right. Good. Yes, but I want it. I want there. I want it to meet. I'm looking for criteria uh, in the new article I'm writing, which uh, which could um, encompass translation and musical composition. We should explain here how you came to be an expert in revision process and why you're interested in the translation profession. So, so you're retired now, but your job was what? Uh, how far back do you want to go? I don't know. You most <laughs> as, as much as you oh, like. All I right. Well, your, your your experience as a professional translator and reviser. Right. But, well, I became a translator purely by accident. I saw. I, I saw an ad in the newspaper by the Canadian government. They wanted translators in the aftermath of the Official Languages Act mm -hmm. passed in 1968. Uh, so I applied, and they said, well, we don't. They said, why don't you come to the national capital, Ottawa? And I said, I don't want to live in Ottawa. And then a couple of years later, they said, oh, we have a position in Toronto, where I live. Okay. So that's when I started, largely by accident. and. Uh, so that's when uh, I started translating, and the translation bureau was expanding enormously. Hundreds of people were being hired every year because all the internal government materials had to be translated mostly into French, from English into French. But French-speaking civil servants could now start writing their materials in French, mm -hmm. and those materials had to be translated into English. So you were going so into that's English. Where I came yeah. in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I was, like many people, I was promoted very quickly, and two years later I became a reviser, and I was in charge of training three new translators. That's how things were working then. You, revisers weren't very senior at all. <laughs> we were now just, they're gods. <laughs> you know, yes, we were just a couple, two or three years more experienced than okay. the people we were training. Okay. So that's how I became a reviser. And then uh, I... After a while, I, uh, I was asked if I wanted to teach revision at the new bachelor's degree program at Glendon College, mm -hmm. at York University in Toronto. So I said, sure, I'll do that. And that's, I think, when I became in, interested in, uh, well, I, ha I had to, of course, formulate ideas for the students. So I actually had to start thinking about revision and saying out when, loud when to students. When was this what what period are we talking about? Uh, this was 1980. Okay, so it's going right back. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Before no. you were publishing. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wrote an article in an internal publication of the Translation Bureau about how to revise your own writing. Okay. As early okay. as 1982. All right. But uh, I didn't. And then uh, uh, later I did a survey of revision courses to find out how revision was being taught and that was when I had my international introduction because I went to a, a um, international conference here in Denmark at okay. El in Elsinore. Oh right, <laughs> I remember that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, I think in fact you spoke just before me you know, Probably. on the first day of the conference. Uh, so that's how I came so, to revision. Correct me if I'm wrong, but all, I mean, have you had an academic post, or have you been a professional government translator, reviser, all the time? I've never had an academic post. Okay, but you've, you've done lots of teaching in academic context. Yes, I'm a so. contract, contract. I'm a contract teacher. Yes. Okay, is that a good combination? There aren't very many people. Well, there are a small number of people to do it. I yeah, find it very tends to be reward. people in academia who do some translating. But you would be the opposite. Yeah. Yes, well, um, the translation schools in Canada do seek out professional translators mm -hmm. to come and teach the practical courses. Sometimes they don't succeed, and they have a bad situation, or at least they did back then, where professors of literature were teaching translation to people who were going to be translating financial texts. And that, so that happens so. in many places. Okay. Let's go back to when you're in your early, mid-twenties, okay, well, presumably before you were translating yes. professionally. What, what were you doing? What did you study? Uh, <clears throat> Um, well, starting from 1965 to 69, I was in uh, doing my bachelor's degree mm -hmm. in modern languages, mm -hmm. French and Russian. Yeah. And uh, in 1967, 68, when I was 21, 22, I was in, at the University 
of Aix in Provence. Ah, okay. So I was there in France during the famous 1968 events. Right, okay. Although I wasn't in Paris. Yeah. I was in... in <laughs> <laughs> Don't do another cut. <laughs> Should we get another chair, is it? I don't know. It's okay. No, okay. All right. We'll cut that. So you weren't in Paris. Whatever. You're going backwards. Could you just come in a bit? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. That's good. And from there? So you, you had these two years in, in France, mm. and you went back to Canada. And then I went back to Canada, and then okay. I started uh, uh, my master's degree in linguistics. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, I, uh, I was specializing in studying one of the Aboriginal languages of Canada, a problem in the syntax. Oh, of, wow. Uh, so it's real linguistics. Yes. Yeah. It was a problem yeah, yeah. in the syntactic structure of okay. Ojibwa, which is a language spoken to near where I live. Okay. So I did that for a while, but then I saw this ad yeah, yeah. when I was about 26 years old in the paper. I was working, I went on from my master's degree to start a doctorate, which I never completed. In I what? Did, in, 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 in the linguistics? Yes, yeah, in yeah, linguistics. Yeah. I did field work. I went, yeah. lived on a, <clears throat> on a reserve okay. so that I could right. investigate their language. Uh, but then I saw this ad in the paper, and that's yeah. when everything changed. I okay. suddenly, on... June the 10th, 1974, I became a professional translator, okay. and I, okay. I tried to continue with my th doctoral work, but I couldn't do it after translating eight hours a day. I did not want to spend the evenings and the weekends writing a, a doctoral th dissertation. So that was the end of that. So you've seen, from the, from the 80s, 90s, and, uh, you've seen the development of translation studies <clears throat> in Canada and, and in Europe, I guess. Are you happy with that development? Do you see it as a success story from the perspective of the profession? Oh, from the perspective of the profession? Well, if we should be doing more now to, to look at the profession, to do more work that's for, based on professional perspectives. Yes. Well, I, I've always felt there's a huge uh, tension there. I guess a lot of people feel that. Um, They're always within academia. People are interested in whatever they're interested in, which has very often not been what professional translators are interested in. Uh, and in other words, yeah. the interests yeah. are yeah. perfectly legitimate, yeah. but they often don't tie in with what professional translators are interested in. Yeah. So there's uh, there's been a division. It hasn't bothered me much because I often find what people, the things people are interested in, are very personally interesting to me. But as a translator, they're mostly remote. Uh, not so much more recent. More recently, yeah, I mean, things we have, have workplace better. studies, cognitive yes. process studies. Yes, yes that's what I mean. We really are coming. Oh yes, to it. yes. Uh, what I'm talking yeah. about is the the 80s, yeah, the 90s. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, But no, more recently, was well, now we have these workplace studies. It's getting much. Things are getting yeah. closer and closer. Though I don't know whether there are people in the workplaces, well, people in some workplaces are aware of it, but I think there's still this idea that we're it's not... pretty marginal and it's starting. Yeah. Yeah. But all the cognitive work as well, oh, process yes. studies, I mean... Yes, eventually that's going to seep into the profession. But we hope, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I'm... I think things are going in the right direction. Yeah. Okay, although you're not happy, I mean, the, the article in Translation Studies suggests you're really not happy with the widening concept of translation. No, I'm not. That's good. No. Yeah. no. Uh, I'd like a narrower concept and one that's as closely related as possible to the actual profession. Yeah, and, you know, I, I just like people to be clear about what they're talking about. That's, uh, Okay, are there any particular areas that you think we should focus on? If you're a young person looking for a research topic or area, what would you recommend? Oh. Well, uh, my particular interest is revision, of course, and there are topics which certainly need to be studied. Uh, one of them, for example, is why do revisers miss mistakes in translations? There's this whole question of attention, of what you're paying attention to. Now, I don't know how to study that, uh, but uh, that would be something that a young person, perhaps from a psychological yeah. background, could look into. Uh, you can't correct a mistake until you've found it. 
So why do people miss them? Because people do miss mistakes, right. revisers do miss mistakes, and why is that? We need to know more about that. And we need to know more about just simple questions like, does it matter when you're comparing the translation to the source text, whether you read a sentence of the translation first or a sentence yeah. of the source text first? Does it make, does it make no difference yeah. or does it make a difference? We need to know There is the some answer. research on these things. There's a there's but, little research yeah, on yeah, that, yeah, yes. Yeah. Anything else? Um, no, nothing else comes to mind, no. <laughs> okay. Um, should there be more dialogue? I mean, let's say young people are looking for topics for research. Should they be talking with translators or talking with representatives of the profession? Or talking with their academic <clears throat> advisor about, about what's going to sell? Uh, well, I think the thing to do is to find actual working translators. One of the problems, I yeah. think, is going is trying to work through translation agencies and the like, because you don't want to be talking to the managers of translation services. Yeah, they give you lots of hype, but yeah, so everything's good fun. Yes, going, yeah. there's, a, yeah. there's struggles going on in workplaces now, who's going to decide things? Right. Is it going to be the managers or is it going to be the translators? Okay. So, uh, and, which is an interesting topic in yeah. itself. Yeah. Yes, that's certainly something to research. Yeah. But uh, the main people to contact are the actual working translators.